Today we are going to talk about investing in mobile home parks uh, and um, Frank Roth here is um, uh, here with us and he's from Mobile Home Park University. I'm Kavita Baratake. I'm a principal at Cherry Street Investments. Um, just a quick disclaimer, all this is uh, for educational purposes only. We are not selling anything here. There's no sales. There's no um, um, pitch here for any kind of investment. It's purely educational. So always, always consult your attorney, financial advisor, and CPA for any specific uh, investments that you want to make and make sure that it's, it's the right thing for you. A quick introduction to myself. Um, since a lot of new faces are on the call today. I, I will run through this really quick. I'm a principal at Cherry Street Investments. I have been a real estate investor and a full-time multifamily sponsor for the last 10 years. Um, I started multifamily three years, but I started in real estate about 10 years ago. And I was a technologist for uh, almost 19 plus years. I worked for IBM and then a company called Atlassian. I have graduated from the University uh, of Texas A&M University in College Station with a master's degree in computer science. And um, I left the tech world behind and got into real estate full time last year. So I'm super happy to be doing this. Um, I own and manage rentals as well as multifamily apartments um, throughout the country, uh, about 650 doors in multifamily. As a general partner, I live in Austin, Texas. I have a 15 year old and I have two puppies. Um, Frank Rolf, and like I said, I'm super, super stoked to get Frank on the call here today. He is amazing, um, and he's been an investor in mobile home parks for almost 30 years, and uh, he has an incredible amount of experience uh, in the industry, and he's owned and operated hundreds of mobile home parks during this time. He is ranked, along with his partner, Dave Reynolds, as the fifth largest mobile home park owner in the country, with over 250 communities spread across 25 states. Along the way uh, in his investing journey, Frank began writing about the industry and wrote a lot of books uh, and turned that all those into a course and boot camp on Mobile Home Park University. Uh, that has become a leader in this uh, niche of uh, commercial real estate uh, and it's called Mobile Home Park University course and I actually went for that boot camp and met Frank. So he conducts boot camp also for RV parks and self storage investing through his RV University as well as self storage university flags. Uh, he's a well-published author and an authority in the mobile home park space. Obviously, he's, you can find articles on New York Times, Bigger Pockets, and a lot of other prestigious papers and websites in RE Investing. So with that, I want to hand it over to Frank. Uh, thank you so much, Frank, for being here. I'm super excited to see what you have to share with our viewers today. Great. Thank you very much. Very excited to be here and always, always excited to talk about the mobile home park industry. So uh we'll go ahead, get, go ahead and get it go you do you have you have my yes. slides there i'm going to share okay. it in a second here okay all uh, right there all right. we go okay perfect all right well again uh as she has so properly uh, introduced we'll be talking all about Mobile home park investing, which uh, also includes the uh, the names trailer park, manufactured home community, land lease community, and the some affordable housing. So uh, all those various titles you've heard over the years, those really all represent what you're seeing in the photo there, which is basically uh, a detached dwelling on land in which the occupant typically owns the mobile home, but we own the land. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide there. So some background on who we are, uh, that's a part of my, my photo of uh, my partner, Dave Reynolds, there on the left, I'm on the right. Uh, we've been working together now for a long, long time. We were originally competitors and then we merged into one, one cohesive unit back in about 2010. Uh, we are the fifth largest owners of mobile home parks in the U.S. In fact, that makes us the fifth largest in the world because there are virtually no mobile home parks outside of the US, except for uh, a small supply, about 5,000 of them in Canada. There's 44,000 in the US. Uh, we've got uh, close, close to a billion dollars of assets in the portfolio, about 200 communities in 25 states. So needless to say, we are very well meshed into the industry. So that's, that's something that we know, know well and work on every day. 
And we'll go to the next slide there. And this is a, uh, this is a map of our portfolio. And I do not worry about the colors of the dots because it doesn't mean anything. Those are uh, colors of different regional and district managers we have, which properties that they manage. But you'll see that we're kind of spread out. We're predominantly in what's called the Great Plains, which is that vertical stack of states beginning in Texas and ending in Canada, and then the Midwest, which is that rough affiliation of states from the middle of America up on the right-hand side. But despite that, you'll see that we are in many, many other parts of America, down in Florida, we're in Rhode Island, we are in, uh, you know, Wyoming. So, so we're not just Midwest and Great Plains, but that is our, that's our home turf. And uh, so we'll go to the next slide there. Uh, so let's start off with what, what is a mobile home park? Well, the definition of a mobile home park is any platted property with two or more mobile homes on it. Now that, that then brings into question, what about when you're driving down the highway by a farm and you see two mobile homes on one piece of farmland, one owned by the uh, farmer and one by the farmer's son or daughter. Well, that does qualify technically as a mobile home park, but that could not be far, far, far enough away from what we're going to be talking about today. We're talking about actual investment grade mobile home parks. So uh, we're going to throw all those out the door. And when you throw those out the door, there's about 44,000 mobile home parks of what are truly uh, investment grade mobile home parks. So we'll go to the next slide. So you've got about 50,000, although the number is actually 44,000 mobile home parks in the U.S. And they are distributed throughout America, except for one spot. And that one spot is Hawaii. Now that, in fact, is no longer true because the state of Hawaii itself uh, built a mobile home park recently as a test to see if they could provide affordable housing via mobile home parks in Hawaii. And it didn't work too good, I don't think, because they were so bad at, at bidding that they ended up spending $330,000 per unit. So they spent as much wow. as a sick, sick build home to build the mobile home. So they probably aren't going to do that one again. So let's just say there's, there's mobile home parks in every, every, every of the 49 other states. So we'll go to the next slide there. And this is the interesting part. The uh, mobile home park industry actually has a very colorful history, which most people are fully unaware of, uh, but it's worthwhile to note because it will tie to some things we're going to discuss in a minute. Uh, the quick history is, if you go back into the 1920s when they brought out the automobile, and only wealthy people could buy an automobile, well, the wealthiest of the wealthy, they did not like the one feature you had when you drove an auto back in the 20s, and that was when it got dark out, and those 1920s cars had just terrible headlights. Uh, you had to pull over to the side of the road when it got about dusk. And the problem is there were no motels back then because the only hotels in, in, in America were near train stations, which is how the regular public traveled. So the people in the cars, they would have to sleep in tents on the ground. Well, wealthy people did not like this. So what they did is they went to folks who mostly built, built yachts and asked them to build uh, effectively a yacht, an eight foot wide, which is the same width as a Chris Craft yacht, structure on wheels that could be pulled behind their car. They often named them just like a yacht and they often had crystal chandeliers in them that swayed as they drove. Uh, they had uh, china patterns, sterling silver patterns that all tied to the name of that of that trailer. And they probably went across America on them. And what happened was cities saw these wealthy travelers and they thought, man, how can we get them to stop in our town? Because if they stop in our town, they'll buy lunch or dinner and they will maybe buy souvenirs. And they might even open a business here or buy a house here or do something. So... They wanted to get them to stop. So how do you get them to stop? Well, there was, at that time, there was no place for those things to park that would fit because most of your parking in small town America at that point, and even the big city was mostly on street, parallel parking or very, very dense parking lots. So they decided to build these giant fields, paved fields, and these were called trailer parks. So early trailer parks were considered to be a, a blessing to any city that could afford one. They proudly had the name Trailer Park and a big giant metal arch over the gate. And Trailer Park meant wealthy people found here. So that was, the, that was where the industry began. And so what happened was the industry started off with high demographics. It held that position through the 1940s when World War II broke out. World War II caused the U.S. government to need a lot of housing quick for all those people they put in the Army. So they decided to buy up or manufacture 500,000 mobile homes, single biggest 
housing order in mobile home history. And then what they did is after the war, they put the returning military folks in these on the GI Bill, having moved those to college campuses. And in fact, if you look at almost any college in America, you will see a plethora of mobile home parks surrounding it. And I went to Stanford University out in California, where there, in fact, was a mobile home park right in the campus, right by what's called the Quad in prime real estate called Manzanita, had four students per trailer, 150 trailers in there. And so the, the reason this is important is there was a brief moment in American history in the 1950s where the demographics of people in mobile homes was higher than those in stick-built homes. And if you want evidence of that, uh, I will give you uh, uh, two bits, three bits actually. One, uh, Lucy and Ricky of I Love Lucy fame in the movie The Long, Long Trailer in 1954 uh, moved out of their Manhattan penthouse to live in a trailer park because it was more highfalutin. In 1963, Elvis Presley lived in a mobile home park in the movie It Happened at the World's Fair. He lived there proudly. Everyone in the park drove sports cars. They were all returning military guys in law school, medical school, dental school. And then he did it again in 1968 in the movie Speedway. And then he even did it in real life. Elvis had a mobile home and a mobile home park that he owned uh, not too far from Graceland in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And he actually liked living in the trailer park more than in Graceland. And if you look up Priscilla Presley's book, she raves that uh, the best times of their marriage happened in the trailer park, not at Graceland. So at any rate, people loved mobile homes and mobile home parks all through the 50s into the 60s. And then what happened was in the 60s, all those GIs who started their careers, uh, their careers flourished and they all moved into suburbia. Uh, then the uh, mobile homes became somewhat abandoned and that's when they kind of fell more into an affordable housing mode. Let's go to the next slide there. Okay, so who lives in them today? Well, it's a very diverse market. Uh, believe it or not, there are some billionaires that have mobile homes as addresses up in New England, an area called Montauk. Uh, it's not their primary residence, yet it, it shows as a residence on the tax rolls. Uh, theirs are in a, a very special mobile home park on the beach in Montauk. Uh, they apparently use these for uh, beach parties. They use them to uh, change and shower between surfing. Uh, but you do have uh, millionaires definitely in mobile home parks down in Southern California, the two parks. Uh, Point Doom and Paradise Cove, both in Malibu. You had a lot of stars there. Pam Anderson, uh, Sean Penn, uh, Hillary Duff. A number of people live in those. But again, that's at the very high, highest range of the spectrum. In the, in the bulk of those 44,000 parks, you have just a, a varied mixture of people, uh, single, single adults, old, old, older, older couples, uh, families. So it's a very large market. To live in mobile home parks today, very varied market. And let's uh, go to the next slide there. So uh, this is an interesting item that came up about a decade ago, this stat, which scared a lot of people because we always think of America as being very wealthy, but you know, 20% of all American households make 20 grand a year or less as their household income. And that's a lot lower than many people thought prior to that stat being released by the government. And in fact, then the government after releasing the stat said, Oops, we made a mistake. We left off all undocumented workers. It actually turns out it's somewhere between 20 and 30%. So you actually have quite a bit of America needing affordable housing. We'll go to the next slide there. Uh, and additionally, you've got, and they call it the silver tsunami, and I'm a baby boomer, and anyone born between 1946 and 1964 is also a baby boomer. But it's a basic fact right now, you have 10,000 baby boomers per day retiring, and they're retiring on an average of $14,000 per year. And that is uh, not a lot of money, obviously, in America today. And so, again, uh, they need affordable housing. So it's a very big portion of America that's right now also needing affordable housing. So we'll go to the next, next uh, slide here. Um, so if you earn $20,000 per year, then what is your budget for housing? Uh, that's something that Dave and I are always pondering. We're always pondering if we're in the affordable housing business that how high – can the rents go and still be affordable? And our theory is for people who are making 20,000 to say 30,000 a year in income, that, 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 that ceiling is about 500 to $600 a month, which would represent 30% of their income towards housing, which is, a, uh, which is you know, the appropriate amount uh, uh, we, you know, we think for most people to be able to afford. And that's based on the US, uh, their own response to that. So we'll go to the next 
slide. So if you've got a budget of $500 per month, then the next question is, you know, what, what, what are your options? Like what, what can you do uh, to have a nice, safe, clean place to live? Well, uh, house and subdivision, not a chance. Uh, house and subdivision average is $1,500 a month. Average purchase price in America, 200000 So that's, that's not even on the radar. So let's just cross that one off. Then you say an apartment. Well, no, the average apartment in the U.S. is now at about 1200 a month on average. So that's not going to cut it either. So what's it leave you? It leaves you a mobile home park because, yes, we actually can provide housing for 500 bucks a month without any subsidies at all, any support from the government. We actually are the only folks who can do that. So go to the next slide there. And so what you've got is you've got only 44,000 mobile home parks in the U.S., but you've got 60 million people that need those mobile home parks, that need affordable housing. So that's why the demand is so extremely high for this industry. So it's just basic economics. So let's go to the next slide. And as we all know, whenever you have a restriction of supply and growing demand, then prices go up and it also results in profit. And you might say, well, why is the supply uh, capped? Well, that's an interesting question. They haven't allowed any new mobile home parks to be built really at any scale since the 70s. Uh, main reason for that being several. Number one, most Americans have a huge stigma against mobile home parks. They don't want them built anywhere near their home. But probably more important is that cities lose money with every single mobile home park because they get in very small amounts in property tax, but they have very, very large costs. Each kid in the park costs your city about $8,000 per year in uh, public school education, not in counting uh, those who need health care, who do not have insurance for that. Uh, so the bottom line is that it's very, very unprofitable. In fact, there are single parks. We own some that cost the city up to a million dollars a year in total loss between tuition and, and what's paid in tax. So that's another big reason why they don't allow it, any to be built and have not in, in almost half a century. So we'll go to the next slide there. Okay, some things you should know about mobile home parks. So let's just jump into that. First off, moving to mobile home costs around $4,000. So what does it mean? It means mobile homes really aren't mobile. And then the question is, why'd they call them mobile to begin with? Well, they call them mobile because they do come out of a factory on wheels, so they can move them the first time out. But they're really not mobile. In fact, the name mobile went away in 1976 when the industry adopted the new name manufactured home. Uh, because they didn't want to emphasize the mobility since the mobility isn't really there. But nevertheless, you know, the early term was trailer and the next word was mobile home and the mobile home was the one that stuck. That's the one that Google Analytics say we all consider the product you see in that picture. We all call that mobile home, but they're just not mobile. And why that's important is because your customers really don't move around much. Uh, they estimate that something like 98% of all mobile homes never moved from the spot they were originally delivered. So it's an interesting point, which we'll come to again in a minute here. So I'll go to the next slide. Uh, and we already went over this. And because very few homes ever leave, again, occupancy always remains very high. Uh, it's uh, you know, a typical mobile home park. If you bought it at 80% occupancy, it, it can only go up and there goes backwards. Another interesting point is you only rent the land. So we have no toilets to fix, no roofs to repair, nothing. And in that photo there, we don't own anything except the grass, the concrete, and uh, the trees, and that's all we own. And that power line that you can see there on the left, that's the limit of our ownership. And all those homes, we don't have to tend to. Go, go to the next slide there. Uh, you know, the returns in our industry are very, very high compared to the other forms of real estate. Typically, most park buyers shoot for a minimum of a 20% cash on cash return. And then after a few years of raising rents, it gets up there into the 40, 50 percentile. So we, we are the last frontier in real estate of high returns. Go to the next one there. Okay, uh, this is a very important item because this is what got me into the industry and to some degree Dave as well. Uh, when we got in the industry, you know, when you, when you don't know a thing about something, obviously you have a lot of terror. And one way to reduce that terror is to have the seller carry the financing because then you feel like they must be telling the truth because they're still in the deal. They have skin in the game. Uh, additionally, it makes it a lot less stressful on you because typically it's seller financing that's non-recourse. So uh, you feel like you don't have you don't have as much skin in the game. And for because we are more, normally buying from moms and pops, many of them will carry the financing, which is fantastic. So a lot of people, their first deals and second deals all have seller financing. Uh, next thing is that since few people know about mobile home parks, the competition is very low. 
Uh, you see, like on every street corner on a weekend, even in small town America, signs that say, I buy ugly homes or cash for homes. But you don't see hardly anyone ever talking about mobile home parks. So we'll go to the next, uh, next slide there. Okay, so let's go over the mechanics of a sample mobile home park deal just to kind of orient you with how it works. So we're gonna make some assumptions here. We're gonna assume you've got a 50 space mobile home park with rents of 250 per month. So go to the next slide. So that gives you 50 lots times 250 times 12, $150,000 in revenue. The expense ratio on a mobile home park is a range of 30 to 40%, 30% of the tenants pay their own water sewer, 40% of the park pays it. In this assumption, we're gonna assume that the park pays water sewer. So you take 60% of 150,000 of, of profit and that gives you a net income of $90,000 per year. So if I pay $900,000, which would be a 10% cap rate, and I put down 20% of that $180,000 and I borrowed 720,000 at 6%, that would give me 43,000 $200 a year in interest. My net cash flow is 46,800 a year, which is a cash on cash return of 26%. And that really ties back to the, the general premise of the industry, which is how do you make 20% plus cash on cash return? Well, that, that example pretty much shows how that can be accomplished. And it's based on something we call spread, which is at least a three point differential between the interest rate and the cap rate. In this case, you have four points, you have 6% interest and 10% cap rate. I could have lowered the cap rate down to nine and still had a 20% uh, cash on cash return. So that's the key is that three, three point spread. That's where, it, where what makes it happen. Okay, but there's more to the story. So uh, what, what else does this all mean? So let's go to the next slide there. Yeah, let's assume you can now push those rents to 300 a month. We, we use 250 in our assumption, but let's assume I can just raise those rents up an additional $50, whether it's in one one time increase of 50 or maybe uh, you know 25 for two years. So let's see what then happens. So that increases the cash flow by $50 times 50 for 50 units times 12 for 12 months. That increases the cash flow 30,000 a year. So that one single item does that. And now go ahead and go to the next slide, that's fine. Uh, so now the park is making 76,800 per year instead of 46,800, which is now 43% cash on cash return. And bear in mind, that's in a world where CDs are paying 1% to 2%. So that's like making about 20 to 40 years of interest in each year with the mobile home park versus the ever safe CD. So let's go to the next slide there. But there's still more to the story. So let's see what else there is that you've accomplished. All right, assuming a 10% cap rate, you just created, whether you raise that rent $50 in one year or $25 a year for two years, you just raised value by 300000 just off that one item. So in other words, if you bought the mobile home park and you did nothing more than just raise the rent, $50, and, and regardless of how many years it takes you to do it, you made 300,000 of profit just off that one maneuver, which is fairly impressive and is a testament to the power of volume. So let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, and that means if you sold it the next day, in other words, if you raised the rents up $50 and then you sold it, you'd have a 150% cash on cash return when you add in the value of the enhancement value of the park, which means it would take you 150 years in a CD to make as much as you did on that one or two year adventure, which is, I think we would all agree, fairly substantial and worthy of further inspection. So let's go to the next slide there. So what if you don't have $180,000 for the down payment, you might say, well, you know, number one, that was a sample of that park. There's lots of parks out there in different sizes. There's $100,000 parks. I once bought a $65,000 park. But regardless of all those things, there's still other options. Uh, you might be able to get the seller to take less than 20% that we use in our model. Uh, Dave and I have done 12 zero down deals to date. So you can sometimes buy things at zero down, 5%, 10%, lower, lower than 20%. Another thing is what's called a master lease with option. It's an interesting construction. You find a very poorly running park and you, instead of buying it outright, you do a master lease with the option to buy at a later period, maybe three to five years later, at a predetermined price. And so you get in it and you fix it and you raise the rents and you cut the costs and then you don't even have to buy it. What you can do is you can literally uh, flip it to somebody. And so it's a way to make money without ever even having to necessarily own it. Finally, selling the assignment. Most of your ground leases and most of your contracts are done 
um, on an and or assigns basis, which means it's the name of the buyer and or assigns, and that gives you the right to freely assign it to anyone. It's not, it, it's not the way it was originally intended because we do and or assigns to allow us to form an LLC to assign it to, but instead it also gives you the option to actually sell that contract. So let's go to the next slide there. So that's basically wholesaling it, right? It is. It's very similar to wholesaling. It's a little, little different, but yes, it's very similar, very similar. Okay, so here are some of our deals, uh, the past and present, just to give you an idea of how these things work. So we'll go to the first, first slide there. Okay, this is a park we bought in uh, Laramie, Wyoming. Uh, you can see from the photos, it's your basic affordable housing park. It's nothing fancy. It's not down in Montauk. It's not in Newport Beach, not in Malibu. It's just a very simple, nice, clean, see, clean safe place to live. So go to the next slide. And uh, the deal came in from a broker. And go to the next slide there. If you've got a whole bunch there, we can just wrap and fire. All right. So here's the case study. Here, here's the basic info. The park is in a great market, which, of course, Laramie, Wyoming is a great market. So that's true. The price is $850,000. That gets you 62 lots with 61 occupied at a rent of two forty dollars a month. It has municipal water and sewer paid by the park. And it also comes with 15 rental homes and three uh, self-storage sheds. So let's go to the next slide there. So the, uh, the broker says, yes, the revenue is $118,222. Our expenses are $67,277 annually. And so our NOI annually is $50,000. 954. All right, so we'll go to the next slide. And that, that takes you to a 6% cap rate, which is not really the kind of cap rate you want to buy. If you'll recall earlier in the presentation, we're seeking a three-point spread between interest rate and cap rate. In this case, that's that's maybe maybe one point, so that's not really very good. So you might be turned off by that, but nevertheless, in our industry, you always go one step beyond that. So let's go to the next slide there. Okay, this is an important item for everyone to memorize, write down, or take note of, and that is a, a simple formula Dave and I developed years ago to help us get a better handle on, on the values of parks. We developed this formula to come up with a, a good offering price. If someone gives us the basic information of lots and lot rent, it allows us to come up with a value of about 11 or 12 cap. But what the formula is, it's, six, it's the number of occupied lots times lot rent times 60 if the park pays water sewer, and times 70 if the tenants pay water sewer. And that takes you about to 11 or 12% cap rate. So plugging the numbers into the formula, just to check mom and pop's work, we do 61 times 240 times 60, and bingo, we are at 878, 400 at about 11 to 12 cap, which is a little odd because mom and pop said it was a six. So we're coming up with a price that has nothing to do with what they're claiming. So then knowing there's a mistake, we move on. So let's go to the next slide there. Now you go ahead and next, next one after that. Uh, one more after that. Oh, there we go. Uh, so we, we ignore all the income except the land rent and here's what we find. So if we go to the next slide, uh, if you take 61 lots times 240 times 12, which is what Bob and Pop's numbers are, you should have a revenue of 175,680, but they were saying 118,222. So that seems odd. That's about a $60,000 swing. So why would mom and pop be so off in the revenue? It doesn't make much sense. So uh, we go to the next slide there. Uh, what we found was the uh, daughter-in-law was in fact embezzling. And I think what was going on is that, you know, the owner of the park owned a lot of different assets. He had a nice house. And I think uh, the daughter-in-law was just jealous and she thought it was unfair. Maybe it wasn't fair. Maybe the guy should have shared his wealth more for the son but she thought it was kind of crazy. He was living in a, in a McMansion while she and the son were living in the, in the, in the mobile home park. So she was just basically skimming 5,000 a month off the park. It had been for years and years and years, maybe, maybe, maybe a decade or more. Um, so we'll go to the next thing. So, you know, can we fix that? Yes. We just fire, fire the daughter-in-law and bingo, everything is immediately fixed. So it makes it simple. So now here's where it gets also interesting because the daughter-in-law was not a very good manager. There were some other items at play here. Number one, uh, the um, they had not been raising the rents or doing anything quite right. So let's go to the next next slide there. And uh, and we, as a result, are going to now set about increasing the value of the of the park substantially, and we'll show you how. So let's go to the next next slide. 
So the first thing we do on this park is we raise the rents from 240 to 300. Why? Because the market was more than 300. So at $300, we're still below market rent. And that increases the value by $800,000, which I know people will look at that and say, no, that's just crazy. There's no way it's correct. No, if you just take the number of occupied lots times the 60 times 12, and all that money goes to the bottom line, you'll see that does increase the value by 800000 So the other thing that we did, did which go to the next slide, is uh, is to submeter water sewer. So submeter water sewer, as you all know, increases the uh, – the expense ratio, I mean, the decreases expense ratio significantly. It's our largest single line item. Now, in this case, we dropped the rent by $10 because we wanted people to feel like they were still getting a great deal. And so we thought that would reduce a little bit of the burden of the submetering. And to go to the next slide, that increased the value by about $370,000. And, uh, and so basically, there was about $1.2 million in value to be harvested on the deal uh, that, that uh, the daughter-in-law had left on the table as, as at mom and pop. So we'll go to the next slide there. And then on top of that, beyond, beyond the land, we still got some other freebies. We ended up with uh, 15 park-owned homes, so we were able to sell those off. So that was, uh, that was another nice thing. We'll go to the next slide. And so the lessons learned were, number one, uh, the numbers given by mom and pops and the brokers don't always mean a lot because often they are chock full of inaccuracies. Uh, it also means that there's many, many poorly run parks out there. That's definitely for sure. Uh, it also means that family does not always make the best manager. We see that time and time again where the family member is alcoholic or not interested or some issue like that. So that's common. Uh, we know that brokers don't always know how to price the park or present it properly, because why did the broker not check mom and pop's math? Absolutely no idea, but they didn't. And then finally, when you find those brokers, stay on their list, because the broker who doesn't know basic math <laughs> is the kind of broker I want to be buying from, effectively. <laughs> so let's go to the next uh, next next example. This is a deal that we bought in uh, Kankakee, Illinois. Here's an overhead schematic of the mobile home park. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, here's how it was presented to us. It was a price of 1.3 million, 167 lots plus 28 mini storage with 98 occupied and 17 storage occupied. And the guy was claiming that the net income was negative 38,000 per year. Well, we right off the bat can see something terribly wrong here by this mom and pop's math, because as I've already said, the expense ratio in a park is a range of 30 to 40%, but it's certainly not over 100%. So there's no way you could have a park with 98 occupied lots and have a negative net income. So right off the bat, when the, when the broker contacts us, we say, okay, we're interested. Send us the package. So we'll go to the next page here. Here's the actual package. And, uh, you know, his revenue is exactly spot on. That is exactly the correct revenue. But there's one item on there we need to uh, memorize for a moment. That's the staff concessions. That is lot rent concessions from members of the staff, 26,118. So let's go to the next slide. Oops. And uh, whoop, go back one, here we go. So remember the 26,000, let's add that to the management fee. So now we're at uh, 66,000 and the payroll 105, we're at 171,000. And then the administrative, so now we're at 200,000. And then we take the one called rep and maint park. That is, that, that is maintenance men's salaries. So the, the guy's got about 260, 270,000 of labor cost on a park with 98 lots. Now, uh, you may have never heard of mobile home parks until tonight and not have any idea what we pay, but we typically pay $10 per lot plus free housing. So this park would typically be managed on a payroll of under 20,000 a year. And he's doing it on 260,000. So this property's turnaround is nothing more than firing the staff. That's all you gotta do, which is exactly what we did. So here are the actual stats after our first year of ownership. Uh, we got the revenue to 467 from about 380. We did that by raising the rent. We did that by filling some of the old abandoned park owned homes. Uh, our total expenses plummeted to 197,000. So we shaved off the expenses, oh, about $230,000. So our net income in that very first year was 270,000 as opposed to negative 38 thousand and if you recall we bought this for a million three so it ended up being a 20 percent cap rate and what's crazy is i don't know if this is the world record in american history but probably has to be close to the biggest record in american history based on 
uh, where things were when the seller handed it off to us and where we were at the end of the year. Because the swing of net income went from negative 38 to positive 270. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, the simple steps to making money with a mobile home park. All right, let's go to the first, first item there. Okay, these are the things that you need to do to succeed with a mobile home park. The first thing you got to do is you got to educate yourself at least enough to know what is a winner from a loser. So I'll give you a quick, some quick synopsis of winner and loser parks. There are five components to a mobile home park that you need to consider when investing. And it spells word ideal. It stands for infrastructure, density, economics, age of homes, and location. So those, those are what you need to look for in the, in the park itself. Additionally, you need to understand that in the mobile home park business, which is all about affordable housing, we need to have expensive housing to have the contrast, the demand, the desire for affordable. So you want to be in a market of roughly 100,000 and up metro size, 100,000 home price, and a $1,000 a month apartment. If you have that combination of factors, uh, it is really hard to do, to do poorly given the enormous affordable housing demand in the U.S., Next item is look at as many deals as you, as possible. You know, there's a there's an old war poster from World War II. It's someone showing a V symbol with their hand, and it says V is not only for victory, it's for volume. And it's the same in mobile home parks as it was back in World War II. Basically, uh, the more deals you look at, the better you always seem to do, because it's a simple fact that as you see that volume of things, you will come across better deals than if you have a lower volume. Number three, it's one thing to look at a lot of deals, but it's another deal to make lots of offers. You should try and make an offer on every deal you see that meets your basic profile of what would be a good deal. Even if your offer is ridiculously lower than what they're asking. Uh, we've made many offers to people who say, yeah, I want $2 million. And we say, well, but it doesn't seem to be worth $2 million. I'll offer you 800 We had a deal in uh, Springfield, Missouri. They wanted a $2 million firm, it said. We said, well, we ran all your numbers and we can only come up with a million. The guy said, I'll take it. So, uh, but you got to make offers. You'll never know what will happen until you make the offers. When you make your offers, sometimes magical things happen. A lot of sellers never anticipated getting their asking price. And when you make your offer, they say, I'll take it or they negotiate back. Uh, number four, you've got to go do great due diligence. Benjamin Franklin, in fact, said that diligence is the mother of good luck. And he was completely correct. That's exactly right. If you do great due diligence, it's rare you ever don't do well. And if you do terrible due diligence, you almost always do terrible because due diligence takes all the risk out of it. Once you've checked all the income and the expenses then and everything else to do with the property, it's really hard to screw it up. Uh, next, you want to get attractive financing. Now, what is attractive financing? We like lots of different kinds. We use seller financing. We use bank financing. We use something called CMBS, which is co called conduit debt. Uh, it uh, originates at banks, but then it's sold uh, to American, the American public. Uh, we also do Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac agency debt. So those are the basic types of debt we do, and they're very, very attractive debt. Our industry is able to get the same types of debt at the same interest rates as office buildings, shopping centers, big apartment complexes. So we, can, we have a lot of really, really good debt out there. This is the biggie. You gotta have a three point spread. You've gotta have a three point spread between interest rate and cap rate to get a 20% plus cash on cash return. The reason you can no longer do it in a lot of other forms of real estate is there, there, there are people who have gotten, so many people have gotten into those sectors, they bid up the prices such that today you can only get maybe a one point spread. A one point spread is not the end of the world. One point spread might get you into a high single figure return level and a two point spread will get you into like a mid teens. But if you want to hit 20%, which has become our industry mantra, you've, you've got to have a three point spread, which you can still do in our industry. Uh, next, you've got to follow the four simple methods to boost the parks NOI. It's one thing to buy the park with the three point spread, but from there you still want to be able to build it up. So you do that by pushing the rents. And this is not what they call predatory capitalism. I know a lot of people in the media are now saying that, but it's not. That's just an absurd remark. I mean, our lot rents in the industry are insanely low. They average about 280 a month in the U.S. Uh, they should be more like 500. I say that because if you inflation adjust the price from 1960 to current, it would be 500. So mom and pop did a terrible job of increasing rents based on inflation, but, but, it, but yet it has to happen because if it doesn't happen, the parks will all end up being redeveloped. 
uh, you fill lots. There's demand, there's demand everywhere in America for affordable housing. Your phone rings off the hook. So why not harness that power and bring homes into your vacant lots and uh, sell them? That's, that's, that's what filling lots is all about. You can do it because a lot of the manufacturers now have programs that will allow you to bring homes in for 0% down. So uh, that's an exciting thing to do. Number three, cutting costs. What's the number one cost we cut? Uh, biggest cost we cut is payroll. We typically buy parks. Mom and Pop often has $100,000 per year managers, which is insane. We replace them with modern twenty and $30,000 year managers. And that one item, that one $70,000 reduction is about a $700,000 increase in the park's value off that one step. Other things we typically cost or, or, or cut is water sewer costs by having the residents take that over. That's the other big item. Finally, improving property appearance because the nicer the property looks, the lower the cap rate, the higher the demand for new customers, the higher the retention of existing. So when you combine those four items together, pushing rents, filling lots, cutting costs, and improving the appearance, it is a very, very powerful combination. And that's where all of the money all of the profit can be harvested in, in the mobile home park. So let's go to the next slide there. Hey, yeah, Frank, really quick. With the ideal, yes. um, it was infrastructure, density, economics. What was the A? A is for age of homes. Age of homes and, and L location. Is, uh -huh, L, L is for location. And let me also add for those who uh, are obviously not, you're maybe first time in the industry here. Uh, obviously infrastructure, that that's, makes sense to everyone. That's roads and water and sewer density, that makes sense. You don't want to have lots that are super duper small. But the homes one is interesting. The age of homes ties back to the fact that, that you know, as, as being in the affordable housing business, we really want people to have an all-in cost of living of that $500 to $600 a month pace. And that means we don't want to have the park with all new homes in it. We prefer to have the bulk where their homes are unfree and clear. Because if we're saying on the front end that raising rents is, is the future of the industry, I don't want people who are saddled with mortgages. And on top of that, anyone with a mortgage is always a risk of forfeiting on their mortgage and having the par home repossessed. So we actually prefer parks that have the bulk of the homes from the 1970s and the 80s, and then just a smattering of newer homes just, just to make the appearance better and to prove that new homes can come in. But we actually prefer older ho housing stock, probably the only form of real estate in America where the preference is to older, because obviously in everything else, whether it's office or apartments or retail, we all seem to favor new things because we always think new things are the way to go. But in our industry, we actually like the homes to be older. Got it. Okay. Uh, so, and now, now I'm ready for some questions. I'm sure there, okay. there, there will be some off that. So yes. ask away. All right, I'll go through the questions we have so far. Uh, the question, the sure. first question is, what about density? What does that mean? Is that the many people in the city, density of the city? Or what is when you talk nope. about density or talk okay. about the density of the park? Yeah, that's density of the park only. And let's, let me go over a quick formula on that. Uh, seven units per acre would be the dream density because a seven unit per acre density means you can put the largest double-wide mobile home on every lot, even though double-wides really go into mobile home parks. So the densities we typically are buying, since these parks are all older, from the 70s, 60s, and 50s, uh, we buy parks with 10 density, 12 density, even 15 density. Mm -hmm. But once you get up into the higher teens, up towards 20 density, you got a problem because the lots may be so small, you can't bring new mobile homes into them, and then the park degenerates into being what's called an RV park. The other problem you have is that some cities have a requirement that the edge of the trailer from one edge to the other cannot be less than 10 feet. And so once again, you want to make sure you've got at least a 10 foot separation of the walls of the trailers. So uh, anything, anything under like 15 density is fine. Again, that's just number of units per acre. Okay. Since you mentioned RV park, I'll talk about the next question. What is the difference sure. between an RV and a mobile park? Is RV even lower cost? And I think there's another, yeah, there's another question on difference between RV park and mobile home park. Sure. Well, let's go back. Let's, we first have to move the hands of time backwards to uh, prior to the 1970s. Our RVs and mobile homes were the same happy family. Uh, there really was no delineation between the two through the 50s and the 60s. But then in the 70s, for some reason, HUD jumped into the mix 
and said that mobile homes, since they were being used for full-time occupancy, had to go under a, a code called HUD code, where RVs, which are considered temporary use, went under a thing called the ANSI code. And when they did that, it permanently ruptured that alliance between the two, and no longer were RV and mobile homes even under the same codes under the U.S. government. So as the two industries separated from being uh, the same industry and went through separate ways, you had new things that happened. You had on the mobile home side, the homes became larger since they couldn't be pulled behind a car. So they kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They went from 8 foot wide all the way to 18 feet wide. They went from 30 foot length all the way to 100 foot in length on the biggest end of it. Meanwhile, the RVs, since they were now free of the mobile homes and perhaps the affordable housing customers, they went uh, on, on a more luxurious path. So RVs became ever, ever more expensive, not always ever more larger, but ever more sumptuous and better designed. And uh, you also had the industry start a very successful campaign called Go RV. And so what's happened today is RV sales are the highest they've ever been year, year after year. Uh, fueled by baby boomers buying them to retire into, and millennials who have have out of nowhere become uh, the, the the almost almost largest, still number two, but nearly as big as baby boomers in enjoying RV travel. So uh, the problem you have with RV parks over mobile home parks is is pretty simple. Our RVs because they have the ability to to move at a moment's notice. They simply pull in and then can pull out whenever they want that business model becomes more like a restaurant because you have to entertain the customer and convince them that they want to stay there and stay an extra day and tell their friends. Whereas mobile homes, which don't move, you don't have that same kind of business pressure. So most of your best RV parks are owned by live-in owners who live either inside the RV park or live in a house adjacent to the RV park and are there every day. And it's kind of the same thing as if you had a you know really nice restaurant where the owner walks table to table during dinner and says, are you happy? Can I make your dinner any better? Obviously, the restaurant with that kind of hands-on owner will do far better than one that the owner's never there, and the managers, therefore, don't do as good a job. So that's the main issue in RV. It's, it's, RV is a great business for people who want to to be there and be active in it, but it's also a tough recipe for somebody who wants to be a passive owner. Um, and there's other attributes but separate, obviously, because mobile home park people have to hold jobs, RVers don't, so RVers can be in more rural locations, issues like that. But that's the biggest difference is just the way the business model turned out in the end. Okay. Uh, let's see. What is the management cost for a park? Uh, the management cost is typically $10 a lot plus free housing, but that's just a guideline. Uh, if you have a 100-space park, that would equate to $1,000 a month plus free housing. But let's say a manager looks like to be really good, and they say, no, no, I need more. I need 20000 a year. Well, then you might do it because, again, it's still really, really cheap. And you might say, uh, where do you find people like that? Well, it's the same pay scale that public storage and the other self-storage operators pay. So we're using basically the same people that we hire. Uh, these are typically uh, retired people, uh, some retired military. Uh, it could be two-income households where you have one spouse that stays home and manages the mobile home park. Um, lots, lots of different combinations where people are not, you know, they're not looking towards managing the park as their sole form of income, but instead maybe a, a side hustle with, with the additional attraction that they get to do things they like to do. Uh, there's another question on: Do you have to evict tenants? I think yes, of course. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Well, any business. right. Yeah. Now I will tell you this. See, you know, we uh, we have about twenty thousand lots, and you would think that in our industry collections would be a big deal, but it's really not, because as long as your residents know that they have to pay the rent every month or they'll be evicted, then they pay because of all the bills they have to pay. Uh, we're the most essential, and then they always have the money to pay it because our rents are so low. Uh, you right. know, sometimes when you know when you go to evictions and there's someone there and they're living in a McMansion, and the rental is five thousand a month, and they can't pay because they lost their job, you have great empathy because you say, "Wow, that's a, that's a tough deal." Like, what would I do if, you know, my rent was five thousand a month and I lost my job, and what would I do? But you know, in our industry, it's different because the typical rent's two eighty a month. So even if you worked at Taco Bell and made minimum wage, uh, you'd still be taking home 1200 a month. So why the heck can't you pay the 280 That's probably another reason why judges are so 
tough on our residents in evictions because there's no way you can explain why you can't afford to pay it. And right. so, uh, yes, we, we do evict, but we don't evict as much as nearly as much as you would think. So how do you handle, there was another question on how you handle rent defaults and evictions. Is that the same as any other asset class? Uh, the only thing we do, which may be a little different, uh, because our residents never fight eviction. They don't ever show up in court. Uh, we often use evictions attorneys, which are relatively inexpensive, which are mostly done come from the apartment industry. We also send our managers to court. And then a lot of times you just do alternative things like cash for keys is big in the industry. I mean, if someone can't pay the rent, uh, sometimes you're better off just paying them a few hundred dollars to leave because it's less than the court costs and attorney's cost. So, um, you know, there, there's different methods to do it, but the bottom line is that once you've trained the residents that, that the next step, if you don't pay is eviction, they seem to always pay. Got it. Okay. Lots of questions coming in. I'm trying to keep up because people are typing in both the sure. Q&A and the chat box. So no uh, problem. I think uh, around the third party management, do you think third party management works for mobile home parks? Uh, yes, there's one third party manager out of uh, Michigan called M. Shapiro. And uh, lots of people use them, seem happy with them. Uh, we self manage our properties, but there are third party management firms that do it. I have nothing bad to say about them. I hear really nothing but good things about them. Now, be very careful who you choose. Uh, Shapiro is the, uh, the one that I know of that has the most happy customers, but there may be others out there too that would be good. But yes, there, there is third party. Okay. I think this one's a simple question. Are the lots sold or leased? If sold, uh, who takes care of the property taxes? If leased, what is the typical lease time frame and annual increases? Okay, well, our, our lots are always, are always rented. In other words, we never sell any of our lots. So that would always be in a rental. And uh, so the property tax is paid by the park owner per lot. Uh, most of the states we're in are one percent tax. Our typical lot valuation is probably thirty or thirty to fifty thousand per lot value. So we pay a tax typically in the park of anywhere from three hundred to five hundred dollars per lot per year. So taxes in our industry, although you know a big deal, they're 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 not a deal killer. Uh, and then in the homes, those are personal property. Those are owned by the paid by the homeowners. Now the the home taxes are very, very low. The average used mobile home in America is probably valued at 5000 So the taxes on those are probably often only $50 per year. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fair, fairly, fairly low amount that you have to pay on the tax. Hey, folks, can you please type your questions in the Q&A box? Because I can't keep up with the chat box and track if I'm answering all the questions. So please type your questions in the Q&A box. So from a tax perspective, are mobile home parks eligible for bonus depreciation in the very first year of purchase? Well, I'll tell you, you've got, you've got me on that one because my partner Dave is the non-practicing CPA of the team, so I don't do depreciation. So I don't know if I can answer that question because that's not the one item that I do with the parks. I don't do the accounting uh, or tax preparation. So I'm, I'm not sure on that one. I'll have to defer that to, to someone in the accounting world. I'm not, I'm not sure on that one. So I think I, based on the donor depreciation and cost segregation webinar I had a few weeks ago, uh, I'm going to say uh -huh. yes. <laughs> the answer is yes, you can use bonus depreciation. So you can look back. Uh, the question came from Sudarshan. Sudarshan, you can look back at the webinar I have on cost segregation, and it actually covers the percentage usually in mobile home parks that we see for bonus step. So that should work. Perfect. Good, good, good. Uh, what kind of neighborhood characteristics do you look for while selecting potential mobile home parks, income, housing type, et cetera? Okay. Well, we are, our, we are commonly seeking uh, the following very basic stats. We're seeking, number one, a metro population of 100,000 and up. We don't always get that. And we have parks in many states, particularly Colorado, where we have less than 100,000 population. Uh, but nevertheless, that is, that's, uh, that's the key that we seek. Uh, then we're looking at housing prices of so the single family home of 100,000 and up and the three bedroom apartment rent of 1,000 and up. We're looking for a U.S. vacant housing rate of 12.2% or lower, which is the U.S. average. We find all that data on bestplaces.net. So if you're going to say, where do, where do you get the data? It's all on bestplaces.net. You put in the zip code of the park. All that data is right there. 
so the, those are the key items that we're looking for. Uh, so that's, that's kind of about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a good question. Um, if a tenant owns a home and they're evicted, what happens to the home? That is an excellent question. I'm glad you asked that because this gets, it gets really strange, but I think it'll make sense to people. Uh, when you when you evict a resident who has a privately owned home, and let's first go back a step. If you own your own home and you can't pay the rent, you have basically several options. One is you could sell your house. One is you could rent your house out. Uh, and then the final one is you can abandon your house. Those are your options. Now, a sensible person would, of course, sell it or rent it. But sometimes the residents, uh, when their lives fall apart, they just aren't even thinking clearly. And so then they ultimately just run off and abandon it. When they abandon the home, the home in every state in America that we're in, you then have the ability to do what's called an abandonment. So you have to run an ad in the paper. You send a certified letter to the last known address of the resident. You do whatever else the state tells you you have to do. And then you have a auction on a certain date, a certain time. Winning bidder gets the mobile home. Typically the park is the winning bidder. Sometimes the park doesn't want to be the winning bidder. It would rather have somebody else buy the home and just keep paying lot rent. Um, but that's what happens. So the homes, when they're abandoned, they always just end up through what's called an abandonment procedure, which ultimately means the home gets owned by the park owner. So that's, that's what ultimately happens to them. So we have 25 questions, so we have to go through. Uh, I'll try to go through as much as I can. Thank you all for that's fine. your no questions. Problem. So question on seller financing. How common is seller? First of all, great presentation, Frank, and I agree. Thank How you. common is seller financing? And what strategy or dialogue would you use to convince the seller to carry the note? Okay, well, let me explain. I think the answer to how you make it happen also tells how frequent it is and why it exists. So when I got back in the industry back in the 90s, it wasn't that easy. We were still doing it. And my first, gosh, my first five deals were all seller financing. But the, uh, the problem was interest rates back then were a whole lot different than they are today. So, uh, you know, back then the CD was still paying like 5% or something. And so it was really hard to get a seller to carry. They'd say, well, I really just put the money in the CD and I worry about it. Then we had quantitative easing in 2007, 2008 after the Great Recession. And interest rates went to about zero and they haven't come back very much. So typically here's how it works. If a mom and pop take cash for the property they pop on over to AG Edwards or some other brokerage and they go in and say, hi, I'm selling my mobile home park. I'm going to get this much cash. And they say, that's fantastic. And they'll say, how risk averse are you? And mom and pop will say, I'm very risk averse. I don't want to risk losing any of my principal. And they'll say, okay, well, I can get you maybe a point and a half in a CD or a treasury. And meanwhile, I can offer mom and pop for a first lien real estate note on an asset that they built from scratch that they totally know. So it's just as safe really as the government stuff, but I'll pay 5%. So I'm going to pay them, you know, almost five times more. Well, if you're a mom and pop, you're going to want the 5%. You're not going to want to get 1% or one and a half percent. So that's why they carry, they carry out of their own greed right now because they get more money by carrying. The other item is that mom and pops, like anybody, they don't they like the, the path of least resistance, and they know that if they sell or find ads, it'll be much easier to close the deal. Won't be any third party reports, won't be any bank committees or anyone else who might screw up their deal. So because it's easier and because it's way more profitable, that's why they carry today. Now, if things change, if quantitative easing ended, which it already kind of is ending, but if interest rates were way up on CDs, if they went to Ronald Reagan era 10% CD rates, well, then probably no one would do seller financing. They'd say, well, jeepers, I just rather get 10% in the CD, but that's not the case. And as long as rates stay as low as they are, which I think they will, I mean, it, it, it would appear we've already topped out and we're going down again on rates, then uh, they will continue to carry because it just makes complete economic sense for them. Right. Okay, great. That's a great answer. So this one, I think, is an interesting question. Uh, I remember from the Mobile Home Park University Boot Camp, you, do, you didn't recommend building a new mobile home park. So I think this is a very relevant question. Do you recommend mm -hmm. uh, cheap land that has no sewers, um, that has no sewer and needs septic and dividing the land to make a new home park? 
No, I don't. And here's why, because I've seen people try it over and over, and they always seem to go broke. So since even the biggest, the biggest guy I saw try it was a company called Jackson Shaw out of Dallas, very large development company. You would think they would know better, but they had this vision that they could be the first pioneer to ever build mobile home parks profitably today. And they went broke with their venture, which was built north of Fort Worth, Texas. But here's the problem you have. Uh, number one, if you don't have, uh, you know, the, the permanent city, which you can't get because cities don't give them anymore, you're going to have to build out in the country and you're going to have no access to city water and sewer. So right off the bat, you're going to have to build a giant well and either a packaging plant or something similar, possibly septic, which is very, very expensive. So that's problem one. So you're going to have a lot more upfront cost than you would in the city where you can just connect to city services. Mm -hmm. Next problem is you're way out in the middle of nowhere. And most people in mobile home parks, they don't want to live out in the middle of nowhere. They want, like anyone else, they want to live in an area that has nice schools and quaint shops and not that far from work. So that's a big problem. Number three, how are you going to fill the thing up? Because when you build it from scratch, you're paying interest day one with no customers in there to offset that. So when you really look at the numbers on building a park from scratch and how long it will take you to build up enough occupancy to pay the bills, you're going to find the rate of return is terrible. And then on top of that, if that's not about enough bad news, there are no banks that I'm aware of that do construction loans on mobile home parks. So you're not going to be able to get good old leverage at 70 to 80 percent LTV, so that makes it, it even compounds the problem worse. So the bottom line is, there's just no money in it. Uh, that's not to say there aren't a few in America built per year. There's probably about 10 built per year, but there's about 100 redeveloped. So we're actually a shrinking, shrinking thing. We're, we're, we're becoming an endangered species. But building new ones, that's not at this moment the answer. That's not. I mean, there 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 is no path that I'm aware of to making money building them. So would you say that uh, if it doesn't have city water and sewer and it has septic, you wouldn't uh, go in and buy a park with septic or because there's some part no, of the we, we, okay. Yeah, no, we, we, we own parks with septic. Uh, we own parks with packaging plant. But what happens there is, you know, that, that's often the only flaw we have. And we can manage around it. We have that tested in due diligence. Uh, it's all factored into the cost, including the cost of for upkeep. So no, you can own private utilities. In fact, in Flint, Michigan, the banks will only make loans on private water because mm -hmm. municipal water is considered poisoned. Oh, but right. uh, it, it's typically, most, most buyers prefer city water to city sewer, but you can own private, but it's really hard to develop private. It's just, you know, where you have so many other problems that the, the prospect of having to build giant private water and sewer facilities out in the middle of nowhere is kind of a deal killer. Got it. Um, so this question is about um, expense ratio. So what does the 40% expense constitute besides collecting rent from tenants? What, is else, what else is the responsibility of the property manager? Okay, your single biggest item on the expense uh, listing of a mobile home park is the water and sewer. You also have a big line item, which is repair and maintenance, big line item, which is the property tax, big line item, which is the manager. Those are, those are really the big four. And uh, so that's, that's where most of the cost, that's where that 30 to 40% expense ratio comes out of. That's the bulk of that. Other significant, but not as large costs would be your, for example, your insurance. Uh, I'm trying to what else comes to mind that, that's, that's really high. That, those are pretty much, those are the big costs. So, uh, and of course, in due diligence, you can nail all those costs to the penny. You can either get the existing cost or you can get new bids. And that's part of the reason why you can do really good due diligence on parks because there's not that many moving pieces to them. Okay. Uh, here's another question. Due to the high court costs and time, if you have a manager stealing money from you for the previous two to four, five months, what is the best course of action? And what are your steps to find someone who might do that and pay them that low amount in free living? Okay, well, let's go over that for a minute because embezzlement in mobile home parks, it's typically not rent embezzlement. That's, that's the old fashioned way. But if you don't take cash, which we don't, that's not very common. The, the more common embezzlement are things where managers do things such as 
uh, pretend that there's big water or sewer leaks and then claim that needs massive immediate plumbing when there really was no problem at all, then they split the check you pay to the plumber in half. Creative issues like that. And that's why we typically like to have managers who have other additional sideline sources of income. We don't want them to look towards their management of the mobile home park as the only thing they have going on. We know some of them do. Some of the larger parks, it is, in fact, their sole item. But in your average smaller mobile home park, that would be a recipe for disaster, probably. And you can obtain insurance against embezzlement. We have it. Uh, so you, you say if a manager, for example, ran off with our rent, we have insurance to get our rent back. Um, so you, you can work around it. Now, the biggest way to work around it today is called your smartphone. So if you recall the old, old Ronald Reagan saying, trust but verify, same difference. If someone calls you up and says, hey, we got a big plumbing leak in the park, well, you want to see pictures of that. You want to see videos of that. A lot of, a lot of the embezzlement came from older mom and pop owners trusting the manager explicitly and never asking for any evidence of anything they did. They let them do anything they want, whether it was spend money on petty cash or just whatever. They often let the manager, in fact, write all the checks for the park. It's just a bad formula in today's world. So, you know, it's typically not a big issue as long as you mind the store, but if you don't mind the store, it would be, it would be chronic. Got it. Uh, Sydney asks, do you ever bring in new homes to fill empty lots or only used home? Boy, that's a great question. Well, let's yes. look. This past year, 2019, we brought in and sold or rented 1,900 homes. Of the 1,900 homes we brought in, uh, by far the majority were new. Probably 1,200 of those were new, and the balance of those were used. Now, the reason we bring in the new homes is that, that they look better and they don't have to do any renovations of them. And there's a company called 21st Mortgage, which is a division of Clayton, that will finance those homes for zero down to us. So we can actually bring in the home and uh, they will fund the home, the set, the skirting, the air conditioner, the whole thing, 100 percent. And then put that in the, the uh, purchase of the home by the customer and then they will finance the customer. So. Uh, that's why we do a whole lot of new. Now, you can still do that progr same program unused, but I have to front the money. I have to bring the home in, set it up, and all that kind of stuff. So it's not quite as good for me as the park owner, but that's why we tend to favor the new over the used. Got it. So quick question there. Was debt service included in your 40% expense? I want to say no, because I know I never include no. debt service. No, 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 it is not. So yeah. the way it works is... And let's go over that for a moment on cash on cash. Cash on cash return is the amount of money you basically get back on your down payment. So when I say 20% cash on cash return, what I mean is if you put $200,000 down, you'd make $40,000 a year. So you're, 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 you're 60 and 70% net income ratio that does not include your mortgage payment. Got it. This is an interesting question. How do you deal with moving connections and skirting costs? Many times tenants cannot afford those costs. Right. Well, what happens is when if someone wants to move their mobile home to our park, which is called an organic move, we, we pay the entire cost of the move and all those items. So on a organic moves, we pay the whole thing about four or five thousand dollars out of pocket. And we do it because it's a quick payback. It's about a one to one and a half year return to get all of our money back. Uh, when someone brings in a new home or we bring in a new home to sell to a customer, all that's included in it. Same with the used. But on uh, situations where people might bring in their own home, we would more than gladly pay those costs because our, our average lot rate, the U.S. average is 280. Our, our portfolio is 380. So, you know, I can make back the, the, a $5,000 check to a customer for bringing in a home. I can make that back in a little over a year. So I'm trying to get the questions going, but it seems like I can never get on top of it. So, Frank, That's before okay. I keep going, do you want to keep going or do you want to take these questions sure. off? I, 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 I mean, no, 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 no one loves talking mobile home parts more than me, so I'm really happy know. to do it if you're... If okay. you're up for it, I'm up for it. I'm up for it. That's fine. So um, let's see. More questions here. Uh, there's a lot of questions around investing. So I'm going to defer all of them and do one big uh, question on that. But uh, if a sure. park was an empty lot, would the park manager sell the lot to you? 
bring a manufactured home and sell it for capital. No, we don't. Sell I'm a little market. lost on that one. Now hold yeah. on here. We don't sell lots off. So yeah, we don't sell uh, lots. The answer to that is we don't do that. You would no. never sell a lot off. We we rent lots. Yeah, we lease lots. Correct. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the average cap rate for mobile home parks? Good question. Uh, the average cap rate in America for mobile home parks probably runs runs in a range from four to five percent for the really, really amazing ones on the beach in California, but those are not the ones you probably want to buy, up to probably a more realistic range of eight to ten. And then on the parks that are a little sketchy, it can go way up there into the teens. Uh, and you kind of get what you pay for. So if you're buying a park with a really high cap rate, there's probably something wrong with it. Uh, but our industry is still predicated on that three point spread. So typically your, your goal, which is attainable is to get three points between the interest rate and your cap rate. So if you're going to buy it at an eight cap, you want to be borrowing your money at a five, which is kind of the going rate right now with banks. Got it. So there's another question about building. I think, uh, what is the cost of building? And the qu answer, I think Mo uh, Frank already said is you don't want to build a mobile home park because you invariably well, lose no, money. Well, no, let me, let me, yeah, well, but here's the deal. Sometimes you can do additions of existing parks. Mm -hmm. So we have four or five of those going on right now. They're not normally not big. You might be adding a couple lots to maybe 20, 30 lots. Uh, it costs you right now in the U.S. about $15,000 per lot to build it plus land. And that's also does not include soft cost. And let's talk about soft cost. If you were in Colorado or some of the states that are really, really into the environment, your soft cost, your tap fee might be 25,000 per space. So, uh, but if you are in, in the states where that's not the case, then if we're on a game show, I'm going to guess the cost to build your, your expansionary lots will come in at $15,000 plus land. This is another interesting question. What's your contingency or process for dealing with the possibility of lower income tenants not caring for their trailers and lots of crime and bad areas and or okay, not well, bad areas? Yeah, let's, let's look at that for a moment. When you say lower income tenants, I assume we're talking Section 8. And Section 8 of mobile home parks doesn't exist much. And here's why. Because most mobile home park owners, they don't want to rent homes. They only want to sell them. And Section 8 people are not allowed to buy. They're only allowed to rent. Hence the, the fact that mobile home parks and Section 8 just have never had a very strong relationship together. So, uh, But that's not to say you may not have residents who don't have big incomes. We've got people in some of our parks that have a disability income of maybe $750 a month. And yet they're still uh, you know paying lot rent, paying their utilities. Uh, so... What, what we do as an industry is we, we really uh, live by two rules. One, we call no pay, no stay. You have to pay your rent timely or, or you can't live in the park. We evict you. Number two is called no play, no stay. You have to play by the rules of the park or you can't live there also. And that's because we cannot allow one resident to have a poor quality of life and drag down the pride of ownership of all the neighbors. So if someone comes in and doesn't take care of the property and refuses to take care of the property, they will ultimately be removed unless the, the park itself wants to pay the cost to do it. Now, we have many tenants in parks that we have actually painted their house for free. We've painted the roof of their house for free, fixed their skirting for free, because they can't afford to do it. They don't know how to do it, and we kind of just do that to be nice. Actually, uh, we really don't want to lose any of our tenants. But you, you cannot allow, you know, if you, if you have one resident who just lives a, a, in a, a terrible lack of whatever the appropriate behavior is in civilized society, that's going to drag down the quality of life for everyone surrounding them. And that isn't going to work for you as a park owner. So, you know, you're going to be tolerant to some degree, but then you have to be a little bit intolerant when it starts harming people. So this is another question. Do you use a direct mail approach uh, where you mail the owners directly or do you rely mm -hmm. on brokers? So what is the split no. of your business? Here's there? the split. Yep, we do. We do uh, uh, over half of all of the parks in our portfolio, which is over 200, came from brokers. So brokers are our number one. Mm -hmm. But of the other half, it came from basically three different items. It came from online ads on mobile home park store or LoopNet. 
It came from cold calling, where we basically call park owners and see if they want to sell. And it came from direct mail. And it's kind of evenly split between those three. So if someone's looking to buy in a park, I would recommend you do all four. Brokers, cold call, uh, direct mail, and mobile home park store. That's how most people do it. And then you can get all the, enough volume to really find some good stuff. Okay. Great. Uh, what is the best ratio of park-owned homes in a park? I want to say you don't want to own any homes, right? <laughs> uh, the, yeah, you really don't want to own homes. And let me explain why. Because, again, we, we want to be in the land business. That's, that's what mobile home parks are all about is we're just – we want to be landowners. And when you – you know, homes – uh, I, I guess they can be entertaining to some people, allow you to express your creative side or something. But, you know, mo mobile homes are not like stick built homes. They're, they're not built for the long haul. Uh, you know, you have to treat them gingerly uh, to keep them maintained. And when you, when you rent the homes, people, they don't care. They're not stakeholders. And so they tend, tend to beat them to death. Mm -hmm. And so your repair maintenance can just drive you insane. So bottom line, you don't really want to own the homes. No, pretty much don't. Yeah. Are there laws that regulate how much and how often you're able to raise rents? Uh, yes and no. If you are in uh, the states with rent control, California, New York, Oregon, uh, I think uh, District of Columbia, I think, possibly Massachusetts in some ways, then you have rent control. And you are not allowed to raise rents except as defined by the state. Now, some of those rent controls are, laws are very weak. Oregon's is hilariously weak. They allow seven points plus inflation. Well, that's more than most owners raise rent. That gives you right now 10% per year, which I don't even know why, why they pass that. That doesn't make any sense. But in other states, such as New York, possibly California, it's based on cost of inflation. But other than those few states, so out of you know 50 states, you have rent control in only, I don't know, five or six and all the rest of the states, there's no barrier on how much or how fast you can do it. Now, there are some states that have a barrier to, to how you do it, the speed you can do it. For example, Florida, you have mm -hmm. to give residents a five-year forward forecast each year. So you have to tell them what the rent increases will be five years into the future. So you can't just suddenly make it up. And then there's other states, if you want to raise the rent, you have to give certain amounts of notice, Maybe six months notice. Maybe some states might even be a year's notice, but that's that's pretty much about it. Got it. First time, uh, lots of questions around investing. So typically, uh -huh. we'll, I'll come to that at the end. Uh, but let's see if there are any other questions. There's a lot of about a lot of questions around. Okay, this is an interesting one. What do you do in your due diligence? Maybe a long okay, one. Okay. Well. Know. Yeah, your due diligence is, is it's a pretty big one. We have we have a we have a manual we wrote on it, which is like about three or four hundred pages long that tells you what you do each day. Um, the big items you're trying to figure out in diligence, obviously, are the same factors we talked about: infrastructure, how the park is built, how well it's built, how many years of useful life it has left, figuring out the density. Uh, getting a real handle on the location, learning what the age of the homes are, and then really drilling deep into the economics. So those are key. But then there's some other items. There's some third-party reports that must be done. You have to do a phase one environmental. Mm -hmm. You have to do a survey. Uh, you have to do an appraisal if you're using a bank. You may have to do a property condition report if you're using a bank. Obviously, there's some title work that needs to be done. So quite, quite a few factors, but it's stuff that anyone, if you know what the steps are, you can do. There's nothing in there that's really rocket science are incredibly difficult, but you don't want to miss any steps because mobile home parks for most people are something they've never done before. So you don't want to be a pioneer. You want to, you want to do, do the stuff as you, as you were intended to be doing it. Okay. I think with that, uh, and we're almost close to nine. So I think we have answered a lot of questions and hopefully it's been um, useful. Uh, I think if you guys want to learn a lot more and actually learn about due diligence, I really suggest, highly suggest you attend Frank's bootcamp because it's incredible value. You're going to see for three days. Uh, I, I just thought it was amazing. So 
Uh, definitely, if you have any detailed questions, please go attend the web, um, the boot camp. Um, quick question on the investing, Frank. What kind of minimum dollar amounts and uh, returns do you provide to your investors uh, when, in a typical syndication, the passive investors? Sure. Uh, you know, the, the types of investment products for people passively are all over the map. Uh, I will say just a standard. If I had to take all of the ones I know and then average them, typically you're going to get a preferred return that's going to run anywhere from about 8 to 10%. And then you're going to get a, uh, a profit split after preferred of probably 50-50. I think that's normal. Now, I've seen them all the way from 20-80 to 80-20. I've seen, uh, you know, I mean, there's no rules in America on what those things are, but I would say the norm is going to be a preferred return of 8 to 10 and then a 50-50 split. I think that would be the norm. Okay. I think this is an interesting question, and I remember you did uh, talk about this one, so I'm going to ask, ask you this question. Uh -huh. When you buy a sure. park, is there a ratio of the single wide, double wide, and triple wide that is ideal? For example, in an 80-home um, park, do you prefer ahead. double wide or single wide? Okay. Uh, you, you, there's no ratio like that in the industry because we're all about affordable housing. Uh, double wide costs twice as much to buy, twice as much to move, twice as much to maintain, twice as much in utilities. So people in mobile home parks don't buy double wide. Uh, you, you see them very, very, very rarely. Typically you'll see them in situations where you have baby boomers who have downsized from their home. And they can't stand that, that long rectangular feel of a, a single wide mobile home, or maybe they've got a little extra money. So they go up for the double wide, but they're very, very rare in parks. The, ma the majority of all parks have none. Uh, some parks have maybe one or two. There are very, there are a few parks out there that do have all double wide because they're deed restricted all double wide. We own some of those. We have one in uh, uh, Bloomington, Illinois that's all double wide. We have one in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska that's all double wide, but that's very, very rare. So the industry is really all about single wide. Got it. That was great. Uh, last question. I think we're going to wrap sure. up here because there's just too many people <laughs> asking questions and I can't keep scrolling. No problem. Now. Can I buy your sure. books from Amazon or Barnes and Noble or only a website? I think you can only buy them on the website. I'm not sure. Let me explain what we do on that. Just, just so people know, because we're, we're kind of a strange deal. Um, you know, our day job is we own and operate the fifth largest portfolio in the U S but our, a uh, hobby job has been for decades now educating people on the industry uh, because when we got in it, there was no education at all. And of course, uh, that's not really good for an industry to have no education because then mm -hmm. it gets a bad reputation because people don't do well with it and it scares lenders and everyone. So we kind of want everyone to do well with it. So we started writing books on, on how you're supposed to do it and always put those on the mobile home park store and then later our website, mhu.com. And so if you go on the website, you'll see just a ton of stuff. Mo most of the content, in fact, is free. Uh, but then we also have some books and the course and, of course, the boot camp. But we're kind of or organically grown in a weird way because a lot of real estate things, people, their, their day job is the, is the learning side. And then their, their hobby job is the actual real estate product. We're different. We're, we're, uh, we are real, real owner operators that write for fun and speak for fun. So if you go to the website, you'll find a ton of stuff, which you will not find on Amazon or anywhere. Even if our book was on there, you'll find just a gazillion articles and hours and hours of podcasts and videos and a forum and all kinds of stuff. So I, I would definitely go to mhu.com. That's where I would go. Perfect. Uh, last one, cost of your boot camp. Uh, our boot camp, and that's a great question because my, my partner Dave's uh, son handles all that, and I haven't even looked in years. I think I think the price is, I want to say nineteen nineteen hundred dollars or something for a ticket, and then if you bring a party of two, uh, then it's an extra thousand, I think, for the second. And uh, what we do in the boot camp is basically it's just like a college class. It's not like typical real estate events. It's uh, it's two days in the class, uh, one, one, one or most of one day in the field inside mobile home parks. Uh, we don't try and sell you anything. 
We don't do any coaching. All we're doing is teaching you how the industry works from A to Z. And, you know, the New York Times heard about our class and came to the class in 2014 and then studied the class because we're so strange. And they loved the class. They, in fact, they wrote that uh, my partner Dave and I are the best thing in affordable housing at a time when the nation's need for low-cost places to live has never been higher. And then they studied the students, and they found that 30% of all who attend buy a mobile home park. So um, at any rate, uh, and our next boot camp is coming up. It's, uh, it's in Orange County, California. It's mm-hmm. Friday, March 6th through Sunday, March 8th. I see that here in my di- day timer. But again, uh, you know, I urge you, if you're interested in it, to, to contact Brandon because that, that, that's, that's, his, that's his day job. So he knows far more than I do. I hope I'm even close on the price so, and the dates because that's, that's, not my, that's not what I do. So, Frank, would you be okay if I collect a list of names and send them to Brandon? Could you, could you work out something in terms of a group discount yes. or something? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, Brandon, okay. Brandon is the magic maker. He can do anything. Okay, so everyone, if you're interested in attending the boot camp in California, please shoot me an email. Uh, my email is kavita, K A V I T H A, at cherrystreetinvestments.com. So just shoot me an email. I'll make sure I get all your lists together and then I'll send it to Brandon and we could work out some kind of a group rate, hopefully, for everyone. All right. I think we're going to wrap up now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank, for your time and being so patient and answering all the questions. Thank you, everyone, for sure. joining. Uh, I, Frank, I really appreciate your time. And um, I, I had just a plug for the boot camp. I, I don't get anything for this, but I want to say I was really impressed doing the boot camp. One of the things I like the most about the boot camp is that that is the boot camp you need. You get all the information you need to go out and actually be able to do a park yourself. It's not, a, there's no upsell to the boot camp, right? Like I've been in the multifamily world. I've done a lot of boot camps and weekend training. Uh, they get you in at a low price and then there's a lot of upsell. The, the thing I can tell about MHU is that there is no upsell. It is what it is. And you can keep going back, I believe, to other boot camps once you sign up. Is that right, Frank? Yes, that's correct. And, and uh, you know, I appreciate the kind words on the boot camp. Again, we, we, uh, we've always tried to structure it as a, as a college style class. Mm-hmm. So where adults can actually talk to each other without trying to sell each other stuff. Right. And, uh, and so we think it's refreshing for most people and is just completely focused on, on the learning about the industry. It's not, not us trying to sell, we have nothing to sell you. So there's nothing we could sell you <laughs> to be honest with you. If we wanted to, it's, uh, it's basically, uh, we just, instruct you on everything from the beginning to end of investing in it. And then you take the information and go forward and buy a park if you want and don't buy a park if you hate the whole idea. But <laughs> we, we our, our job is to show you how it works. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I think we're going to let Frank go now. We had a lot of questions and hopefully, uh, I know I didn't cover all the questions. I'm sorry. Uh, we, we just, in the interest of time, if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Uh, I will be happy to forward it to Frank and get it answered for you. Again, thanks everyone for joining and being patient. Thank you so much, Frank, for your time. Have a good night, you everyone. Bet. Thanks for having me. Thanks. All right. Bye.